It's the largest island in Halifax Harbour and it's visible from both the Dartmouth and the Halifax waterfronts. Once it was entirely privately owned and now most of it is a provincial park with trails and roads just waiting for exploration. And that's where I'm headed today. Yeah, there's lots of fish jumping in the water, eh? All right, I'll see you later this afternoon. <laughs> Thanks. McNabb's Island is about five kilometers long and roughly one and a half kilometers wide. In 2002, most of the public land on this island was turned into a provincial park. I'm traveling from here at Ives Point all the way to the other end of the island at Rett Cove. Now there's lots of different areas to explore and lots of history. For example, that point over there is called Indian Point, and it's called that because in the 1760s, the Mi'kmaq were forcibly relocated from Dartmouth to that part of McNabb's Island. Like much of Nova Scotia, there is centuries-old evidence of Mi'kmaq use of McNabb's Island before the arrival of the Europeans, mostly as a seasonal fishing base. While we think of the European founding of Halifax as happening in 1749, as early as the 1690s, the French used McNabb's Island as a fishing center and had planned to build a fortress much like Louisbourg here. Those plans ended with the Treaty of Utrecht in 1713, which ceded Nova Scotia to the British. When Edward Cornwallis finally established a British settlement here, he gave McNabb's Island to his nephews and renamed it Cornwallis Island. It wasn't until 1782 that Peter McNabb purchased this island from Cornwallis for the princely sum of a thousand pounds. He cleared the land and set up a series of tenant farms on the island. And for over 150 years, the McNabb family made a residence here. By starting at Ives Cove, I find Fort Ives as my first stop. This point, an Indian point on the other side of Ives Cove, are part of the island that are facing the inner parts of Halifax Harbor. Construction on this fortress began here in 1864, though plans and clearing began much earlier in the 1760s. There were 160 military personnel stationed here during World War I, and their main job was to protect a submarine net that stretched from here all the way across the harbor to York Redoubt on the other side. In World War II, Fort Ives was still used, but instead it was used primarily as a military barracks. This fortress was updated continuously through World War I. Searchlights were installed along the shore, both here and elsewhere along McNabb's Island. Throughout both World Wars, the military essentially controlled this island as a key part of the defense of the city. There were U-boats patrolling offshore, and this island was used to control access to the harbor. The rifle-loading guns here are still in their original casemates. It's the only fort on the island where that is the case. It's along this road that you find some of the original homes on McNabb's Island. There really aren't many privately owned ones anymore. Even these ones are publicly owned. If you grew up in Nova Scotia, you've no doubt heard of the Bill Lynch shows. Well, they got their start here on McNabb's Island. People have used this island for recreation since the mid 1700s. But in 1844, a steamer started offering trips in Halifax Harbor and McNabb's Island was one of the destinations so people started coming here for picnics. And not just small picnics, some organized events had as many as 6,000 people. One of the landowners after Peter McNabb catered to private picnic parties and established the Woolnose Pleasure Grounds, very close to where I landed on the island earlier. Shortly after, James Finley created the Finley Picnic Grounds, and eventually, a man named Bill Lynch, who was the son of lighthouse keeper Matthew Lynch, bought the fairgrounds, and created the Bill Lynch shows. 
This was the home of Gladys Conrad, who is the sister of Bill Lynch of the Bill Lynch Shows. She was the last permanent resident of this island. This home was originally built as a summer home for a factory owner here on the island. This is the home of Matthew Lynch, who was the father of Bill Lynch. And so this was where Bill Lynch grew up. By the 1940s, the Bill Lynch shows would become the largest carnival in Canada. In fact, their shows would take 27 rail cars. Now, if you're from the Maritimes, you've heard of the Bill Lynch curse, where it always rains when the carnival comes to town. And one of the stories, the reasons behind that, is because those shows started right here, and the rain is a reminder of the water and the tides that surround the island. In the mid to late 1800s, the British Admiralty began buying up land on McNabb's Island to build fortresses and batteries to better defend Halifax. This was fortunate for the McNabb family, who had been trying without luck to sell their island holdings for some time. Most of the northern end of the island, such as the area around the Lynch homes, stayed in private hands. By the 1960s, the military had less use for the islands, and handed most of their land over to Parks Canada. Parks Canada retained and restored Fort McNabb, but ultimately the rest was passed on to the Nova Scotia government, who began assembling land for a park here in 1983. These days, less than 1% of the island remains in private hands. This is Huguenin Point, which includes the battery I walked by moments ago. This land was traded by the Defense Department to the province of Nova Scotia in 2013, marking the final land holdings of the Defense Department on this island. This site is also a memorial to 200 people who died of cholera aboard the SS England on their way to Nova Scotia. Some are buried here in a mass grave. Others are buried on an island just offshore. McNabb's Island is full of all kinds of history, from military to recreation. After the break, I'm headed off to visit the Tea Room and then on to Hangman's Beach and Fort McNabb. I've made my way around Finlay's Cove on my way to the McNabb's Island Tea House, but I wanted to stop here because in this area there used to be a soft drink factory. It was built by the gentleman who originally owned and built Gladys Conrad's home on the north end of the island. They made both hard and soft pop here, right through Prohibition. Like many trail locations, much of the work on McNabb's Island to promote and maintain trails is done by volunteers. In this case, the Friends of McNabb's Island Society. They're a registered charity working not only here, but also on Lawler's and Devil's Island. One of their signature projects has been to reopen a tea room that was built in the 1980s by John and Glenna Jenkins. The tea house was built on the site of one of the former estates. The Friends of McNabb's Island Society have raised most of the money needed to turn this tea house into an outdoor education center, an interpretive place for the island. This tea house was built on the site of the former Huguenon Perrin estate and sits in the middle of the former Victorian garden, so there's a lot of plants around here that really aren't native to the island. The tea house operated for 15 years. I can remember coming here as a kid. So many people, when they come to McNabb's Island, they come and they go to Fort McNabb, and that's about it. Maybe look for sea glass along the beach. But there's so many other trails and so much more to see.
With so many forts and such a large military presence on McNabb's Island, they of course needed a military prison. This area was the home of the detention barracks. Funny thing, in 1900, they changed the name from military prison to detention barracks. I suppose they must have thought it sounded friendlier. There are many ways to travel to McNabb's Island. At one time, arriving at Garrison Pier in the center of the island was the most common. That's certainly still possible, but more often by arranged trips. Where I left from in Eastern Passage has become a more common way for individuals to travel here. And landing on this side of the island makes for a much longer boat ride. Though organized groups and tours still often arrive here, traveling from the Halifax waterfront. Growing up, we used to call this entire peninsula Hangman's Beach, but that's not really accurate. This is Mauger's Beach, and that's Mauger's Lighthouse. Hangman's Beach is actually on the ocean-facing side of this peninsula. So why is it called Hangman's Beach? Well, the British Admiralty used to hang deserters there, and they would let the bodies swing in the wind for days as a warning to sailors on ships entering the harbor that that's the fate that would become of them if they deserted. The beach gets its name from Captain Joshua Mauger. He was a colorful figure in the life of early Halifax. Not only was he involved in the fishery on this island, but he was a merchant, distiller, smuggler, privateer, and a slave trader. In the 1950s, he purchased this area for drying and processing fish and named it after himself. The lighthouse wasn't built until World War II. Before that, there was a Martello Tower built on this site around 1828 that later served as a lighthouse. Interesting point of history, Nova Scotian doctor and geologist Dr. Abraham Gesner invented kerosene and tested the fuel to operate the lighthouse here for a short period of time. McNabb Pond was once closed off to salt water, but during Hurricane Juan, this causeway was breached and the pond was open to the ocean. That, of course, prevented the easiest way to travel to that lighthouse along this beach. This is the site where everybody who comes to McNabb's comes to visit. It's Fort McNabb. This fortress is in the best condition of any of those on McNabb's Island. And that's in part due to the work of Parks Canada, which spent a lot of money restoring this place. You know, construction on Fort McNabb began in 1889, and it served in both world wars. The primary role of this fort was to challenge ships entering Halifax Harbor. And it was in that role that this fortress distinguished itself. Of all the military installations in Halifax, Fort McNabb was the only one to fire a shot in anger against a ship that was trying to evade inspection. Fort McNabb became the epicenter for the island's military operations. It controlled searchlights which illuminated the harbor. After World War II, it continued operation as a radar station. So beautiful here and so much to see. But if I don't hurry, I won't have a way off the island. The thing about visiting trails and parks on an island is you have to watch the clock and make sure that you're back at the boat before it leaves. Otherwise, I would find myself spending the night on the island. As it happens, you can camp on McNabb's Island, though you have to let them know in advance. But that's not in my plans for tonight. So it's off to Rec Cove. This is Rec Cove, where I'll begin my journey back to the mainland. Rec Cove got its name because of the number of scuttled ships beneath these waters. It's said that there are more shipwrecks here than anywhere else in Nova Scotia. Nowadays, this place is popular not only for a pickup and drop off location for visitors to the island, but also for people who want to visit a secluded sand beach. How are you? Good, how you doing? Oh, I survived. Oh. Oh. That's not so bad. 
I guess I'm gonna have to get to the back though, eh? Otherwise, it's, yep. uh, you're never gonna get off the aisle. Nope. There's a ferry, tug, schooners, and even a trawler beneath the waters of this cove. The HMS Tribune wrecked here in 1797, and only 12 of 250 crew survived. The HMS Mars with 64 guns vanished in this cove in 1755 without a trace. In 1950, the Gertrude de Costa sunk in just a minute. Only six survived. McNabb's Island had its moments as a stop for fishermen and as a home for farmers. It went through periods of military history from the early 1700s all the way up into the 1990s. It was even the life of the party with giant picnics and a soft drink factory. That is a lot of history for one island. Well, after the break, I'm headed out around the mouth of Halifax Harbor to another trail system that has a connection to the military history of Halifax and the McNabb family. When you look towards the mouth of Halifax Harbor from McNabb's Island, you see the Shibucto Head Lighthouse, which is a welcoming beacon for ships traveling to Halifax from all over the world. Well, that spot is about 19 kilometers outside of downtown Halifax, and it's the home of the Duncan's Cove Nature Reserve. And Duncan's Cove has a connection to McNabb as well. John McNabb was granted about 50 acres of land here in the mid 1800s one of many families to set up a fishing village here. So Duncan's Cove is a beautiful place to watch sea life. I mean, right out on this rock right now, there are seals and lots of seabirds. This is the actual Duncan's Cove where the trail begins and of course the namesake for this area. This trail meanders along the coastline through many different coves all the way to Ketch Harbor. Duncan's Cove is named after Admiral Adam Duncan, the first Viscount Duncan, who beat the Dutch at the Battle of Camperdown. Duncan's Cove started as a fishing village it's almost 100 years before McNabb and some of the people that came with him inhabited the area. In fact, uh, the first recorded settler was Simon Duntoyne in 1752. It's not just the plants and animals that make Duncan's Cove such an amazing hike. The geology of this area creates these caves that come in through the rocks and creates these haunting sounds as the waves come in and out, almost like you're in some kind of fantasy movie or maybe even creating sound effects for the Lord of the Rings. You can imagine that overlooking Halifax Harbor, this area has long made it a strategic part of Halifax's defense system, right back into the 18th century. Do you remember Camperdown? Well, there's a signal station not too far from here in Portuguese Cove that was called the Camperdown Signal Station, built in 1797, and that was first of a series of stations built by Prince Edward, the Duke of Kent. You might have seen some of the remnants of those in places like Point Pleasant Park and even over at Citadel Hill. It was an important signaling system. Later, that Camperdown signal station became a wireless station and kept operating right up into 1925. But this area, the Duncan's Cove Nature Reserve, well, this continued to play strategic military importance right through into the end of World War II. Well, this area had military importance going right back to the time of the Duke of Kent and the signal stations. It was during World War II that the bunkers in this area were built. And each one of these bunkers housed three six-inch Ellswick naval guns. And they were important because U-boats were always a concern. 
You can just imagine the thoughts of the Canadian soldiers who manned these batteries during World War II. They'd be sitting here looking out at those oceans, wondering whether there were U-boats lurking beneath. And of course there were. We know that U-boats tried to penetrate Canadian defenses. They were out there harassing shipping. And it was the soldiers manning these batteries whose job it was to make sure that Nova Scotia stayed protected. Halifax Harbour remains just as important today for ships traveling from all over the world as it was hundreds of years ago. By the 1950s, World War II was in the rearview mirror for people in Halifax. The military had begun decommissioning the bunkers along this coastline. Now back in Duncan's Cove at the start of this trail, the fishing had really come to an end. In fact, by the 1960s, there was no fishing being done out of Duncan's Cove at all. The community had turned into an artist community. It even had its own private airstrip. Things changed. By the 1990s, the last remaining derelict bunker back in Duncan's Cove became a luxury residence that's almost not recognizable today. And this area, well, this area became the Duncan's Cove Nature Reserve. And so the Duncan's Cove area has become a 370 hectare reserve, stretching almost all the way back to Portuguese Cove. It protects rare plants, gives animals a place to live, and has become an absolutely beautiful spot to hike. So these are wild Ragosa roses. They're fairly common in Nova Scotia. They actually make pretty good jam. It just seems like there's almost every kind of terrain and landscape in Duncan's Cove. This bunker marks the end of the Duncan's Cove Trail, and this point is affectionately called the castle. You can almost imagine it being like a castle back in the days of war when military operations were all over this place. Following the Duncan's Cove Trail, we've come out of Duncan's Cove, which was once a fishing village, and come all the way up to Ketch Harbor, and in the distance is Sambro Light, both places where fishing boats now leave from. The Duncan's Cove Trail is full of history and nature. Wherever your walkabout finds you, I hope you find adventure. Thank you.